want you to be announced to Philip one more time. I'd like to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. At this time, we're going to start our Sunday school lesson. If everyone gets to bow your head for a moment of prayer. <clears throat> Dear most gracious Father, here it is again. Dear Lord, that we just come and say thank you. Thank you, Father God, for our line down there. Thank you, Father God, that you touched us early this morning. Our eyes open wide open. I don't want our eyes, Father God, but we're in our right mind, dear Lord. And we are able to come out and just give thanks and praise to you for your word to be praised. So we want to come and just thank you for all you have done and all you're going to do. Thank you for every day up to this moment, dear Lord. Thank you, Father God, for wrapping up homes around us, Father God, and keeping us safe. Up and down the dangerous highway, Father God, in our everyday life. Father God, knowing that we haven't done all that you have told us to do, and have done things that we shouldn't have done. We know, Father God, it's all because of you that we're here. So that we come to study your word, the Lord, Lord, we ask that you open up our heart and our mind, Father God, that we may receive your word from you. Father God, knowing that your word will lead us to and from all the goodness that you have in store for us. We just thank you. Bless you to bless each and every one that is here. Bless the sick. Bless the incarcerated, Father God. And bless one those that have lost love, one, Father God. For they truly need you, Father God. We ask you to step in and put them in the right mind, Father God, for we know that you are already there, dear Lord. And we just thank you. We ask you to bless this church. Bless the pastor you have put on in the leaders, Father God. Father God, given all that. You see that we need, Father God, to lead us in your direction. And we just thank you. But most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Our uh, devotional reading will come from Isaiah 50, chapter, verses 4 through 9. <clears throat> Verse 4, start off. The Lord God had given me the tone of the learned that I shall now how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waited morning by morning, he waited my ear to hear as thee thou learn. The Lord God has opened my ears, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I give my back to this Smithers and my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. I hide not my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He, he is near to justify. Here is near that justified me, who will contend with me. Let us stand together, who is my adversary. Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, that all shall wax, wax old as a garment. The mouth shall eat them up. Amen. And at this time we have Rep. Young Good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, <clears throat> I know we are kind of shocked, <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, happy to be able to stand this morning and and try to present the Sunday School lesson. All right, I know uh, I stand in some strong company to be able to try, to try to bring this lesson, but nevertheless, we are grateful uh, to be able to be here. Our lesson uh, this morning, the title is All for One and One for All. And uh, it covers a whole lot of territory because 
if you really think about where we are today, uh, we are a scattered nation. Uh, we scatter, we're scattered in more ways than one. When you look at uh, every avenue of life and, and to see what uh, we have uh, become, uh, there's a big difference in what God had intended for us. We have allowed ourselves to become separated. We have allowed ourselves to become scattered. We have allowed ourselves to become isolated. But this lesson today is going to show us what hope is. Because God has already made a promise of what's going to transpire. And uh, we have to depend and we have to uh, stay on course so that we can be part of the one that fulfilled this promise. Now, the key verse today uh, is already uh, the scripture, the background scripture was read from uh, Isaiah chapter 54 through 9, but our background scripture today coming from Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 15 through 28 in our printed text will become from the same 37th chapter, verses 21 through 28. And the key verse is, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And that's Ezekiel 37 and 27. And uh, when, I, when I read that in preparing for this lesson, there were some words that I, that I wrote down. Uh, one of the words was restored. Another word was scattered. Another word was hope. And as I began to study, I had to go back and I had to go back to the beginning of this chapter, uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, a very, very familiar passage. And this is the passage where God uh, took Ezekiel out and he said that the Lord God came up on me and took me out into a valley that were full of bones. And he said, and I looked and behold, those bones were there and they were what? Very dry. Mm -hmm. And you, I don't know about you, but uh, dry bones represent not hope, but failure. Okay? So when he looked out, he saw all of these folk, all of these bones that were just laying there. They had no life. They had nothing. But isn't it strange that a lot of times we're in the same position and we don't even know it? All dried up and have no idea that we're dried up? I mean, think about it. People going back and forth, going to and fro through their regular everyday activities and still not knowing. I was talking to Jeff when he was on the way to Sunday school this morning and I saw some you know, folk putting in at the dollar store, putting in here, putting in there. I said, isn't it amazing that this Sunday morning and these folks have no uh, interest in going anywhere, no interest in going to church, but they can go everywhere else, just like Sunday, just a regular day. This is basically what has happened uh, to this, this uh, Israel that we're going to talk about in the lesson today. Uh, I looked and I saw us, captivity-wise, I saw us depressed wise. I saw us uh, as, a, as a nation that has become overwhelmed and overcome by so many things. And, and it's not basically a nation that's outside like, like the Israelites had to deal with. But we have put our own selves in captivity by choices. Right? We have put our own selves in captivity by choices. So, there are three things that this lesson said that we need to do. Number one is to understand how the unity of God's people and the covenant of peace reveals God to us and to the nation. Number two is to value unity over personal preference. And number three is to grow to examine sources of disunity within the church and develop a plan for peace and harmony. All right, let me say those one more time. Number one is to understand 
how the unity of God's people and the covenant of peace reveals to us, reveals God to us and to the nations. And number two, value unity over personal preference. And then number three, grow to examine sources of disunity within the church and develop a plan for peace and harmony. Now, uh, it says, understand how the unity of God's people and the covenant of peace reveals God to us. Now, God had no plan for us to be disrupted. God had no plan for us to be scattered. God had no plan for us to be in the predicament that we're in. He had no plan for Israel to be in the predicament that they were in. Right? But at the same time, look at what happened. Uh, there were, it, it talks about mountains in this, in this lesson. And there were so many things that uh, encompassed the, the Israelites. Uh, things that were taken from them, their land was taken from them, they, their uh, houses, everything that they, they, they had was taken. But in this lesson, we're going to find out that God said, well, guess what? Everything that was taken from you is going to be given back. Everything that happened, this is going to be reversed. Then he says that, and this is, this is, this is uh, one part of the lesson that I, when I, when I started thinking about it, I, I know somebody was reading this and they said, but then David would be their prince. Uh oh. All right, let's, let's, let's go ahead and go. Uh, but that, that particular thing, we're going we're gonna to discuss that in just a few moments when it talks about David and about the lineage. It's not talking about David per se, because you know David been dead a long time. Mm -hmm. But uh, is that David going to the, be their lineage? Okay, so... Again, our lesson coming from uh, Ezekiel uh, chapter 37, and what I want us to do uh, right quick is to go back and to, to look again, as I mentioned at the pre, uh, preface of this uh, lesson, uh, when God took Ezekiel out, and this is a continuation of the battle of dry bones and the things that, were, that transpired after Ezekiel was, was taken down. There were several things that were asked uh, of Ezekiel do. So in, in order to get the entire understanding of the lesson, uh, we have to look at uh, how Ezekiel began uh, this particular quest. So let's go and look verse number 21 and we're going to verse 21 and we're going through verse number uh, 28 and what we're going to do is I know this is a little bit unorthodox. There's going to be some things that's, a, that's just a little bit different that and you're accustomed to, but we're going to look at five promises, five promises that God made uh, to the people of Israel. Uh, number one, he will restore their land. Number two, God will purify the people from idolatry. Number three, David, as I mentioned, will rule as king. Okay. Number four, God will establish an everlasting covenant of peace with his people. And then number uh, five, God will dwell among his people. And these are the five things that we're going to try to cover today. So let us go ahead and get started. Uh, verse number, we'll start with verse 21. And I like how they got it broke down. There's two different versions. We got it in the King James Version, and we also have it in the NIV Version. So what I'm going to do, read verse 21, and then I'm going to read, uh, from the King James Version, then I'm going to read from the NIV. And it says, And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And the NIV Version says, And say to them, <clears throat> This is what the sovereign Lord says, I will take the Israelites out of the nation where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. All right. So when I started to look at this, I always have to look at today because we, you know, we can reflect back to, to Israel and what happened then. But I, I always like to, to shine a light on the, the, the comparison of the way it was then and the way it is now. Okay? 
to bring us into uh, the, the 21st century. Okay? So, it says that the Lord said, I will, I will take the Israelites out of the nation where they have gone. So where have we gone? Where are we? Hmm? Where have we gone? Anybody? One word comes to mind when we talk about scattered is we've gone what? Astray. We've, we, we have allowed ourselves to be caught up with everything else that's going on in the world. Things have become more important than our relationship with God. Right? We're divided? Exactly. I mean, think about it. Uh, when, when we do the comparison, what are some of the things? We've talked about this in, in Bible study. Some of the things that have, have kept us divided. Well, number one, and we're going to explain uh, why when I say this. There are different denominational structures that bring about different man-made uh, laws and different man-made, uh, what, what's the other word? Uh, uh, I guess you could say their own mandates. For instance, it's more important that I know uh, why a certain denomination does this, then it is important for me to know God. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Can I say, sir, that is tradition? Tradition? That, that's a good word. But, again, and I don't, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want us to be uh, confused by the fact that there's nothing wrong with having uh, different things that you do. But when they become more important than your relationship with God, then that's where the problem comes in. And that's where the disconnect is because, well, I can't go to your church because y'all don't wash feet. Or I can't go to your church because uh, y'all believe in three modes of, of baptism. I can't go to your church because of this or that or this or that. And these are the things that have caused us what? To be scattered. Because of our own man-made belief, not the belief that God instilled into us. That, that Jesus Christ is the most important. Our relationship with him is what's most important. And all of these things that, that we have become more rely, rely, relying upon uh, are not going to get us to heaven. That has nothing to do with salvation. Nothing whatsoever. But we know these mandates, but how well do we know the law of God. So when we talk about scattered and being separated and, 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 and being divided, it's because of these little bitty things that we deem to be more important. That's what happened to Israel. They was in a land with all these people that God gave them. But they started mixing in with the traditions of that land and all that stuff. They took president over God. And then wonder why they failed. And wonder why they became uh, slaves in their own land. I mean, think about it. Put it in perspective. I mean, right now, I, I wrote down some things that that have caused us to be in that same predicament. Uh, right now, I don't know if you can call it a depression, but uh, we've had hikes and, and, and prices and things like that. The inflation has gone through the roof. And, I mean, you go in to buy one of my favorite items to buy in the grocery store is, is a, uh, a quart, uh, uh, I mean, a pint of Miracle Whip, or either a quart of Miracle Whip salad dressing. Okay? I'm not a mayonnaise person, but I like Miracle Whip, and a Miracle Whip called $9 for... <laughs> so, uh, when we see what has happened, we have become what? We have become cap a captive in captivity in our own land <coughs> because of what? Division. And where's the division at? Not only is it in the church, but where is it? Huh? 
Huh? It's in our government. Two parties divided. Right? Two parties that can't agree on nothing. nothing. Right? And they continue to fight. And one fights for this, the other one fights for this. And not understanding that because of the division, it's causing everything else to explode. So now, let's bring that back to the church. How easy is that to be incorporated into the church when you got you don't have Democratic or, or Republican parties, but you got two parties with the same name, but one is on one side, one on the other, and they call cliques. The clique party on the left, the clique party on the right. We're going to fight for this, we're going to fight for this. But we fail to look at what's the main goal. And if heaven is not our goal, then we're wasting our time. But guess what it says in there? There has to be something that, has, that, that, that takes place in, to, in order for the, for the church to be unified, for the, for the world to be unified. There has to be some things put in place. So first of all, you've got to recognize that, you, that you're not unified. You have to recognize that you're divided. Well, let me, let me help us. Scripture says, a house divided cannot stand. I don't care what kind of house it is. A house divided cannot stand. It'll always be chaos, and there'll always be a tug of war. Now, y'all remember when you were in grade school, and we had field day. Or you had kids that were in grade school, they had field day. And you remember the tug of war? They put this uh, little rope in the middle. And the same amount of people on each side. And both pulling in different directions. This party wants the rope, wants the, the, the little flag to come over on their side. And they used to have it where they have a, uh, in, in, on TV they would have like a big ditch of mud. And then they would pull, and whoever fall in the mud would lose. But this is not what God intended. So he says, I will take the Israelites out of their nation where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. This is the promise that God has made for us. That he will bring us back. Now, would everybody come back? No. Why? Because their salvation is not a priority. They don't, they're not concerned about their salvation. So therefore, those that do not accept Christ, and we're going get to get to him here in just a few moments, but those that don't, do not accept Christ uh, will, not, will not have a part of this promise. Okay? So, this is part of uh, God's promise. He said he will restore their homeland and the restoration of God's people from every place and far uh, more away than just to return from Babylon, but it was a divine promise to bring and restore their national unity. Not just bring them back, but fix them back. Restore uh, everything that they had lost that he restored unto them. In order for something to be restored, they first have to be taken. Right? Okay. So, let's go on to verse number 22. And it says, I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall, there be, shall they be, be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. And the NIV says, I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. Okay. So, again, 
Look at where we are. And we have to keep coming back to that. Two kingdoms. Two different groups. But now we we got several. I mean, <laughs> there, 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 there's a whole lot of divisions. Now God, he, he's talking here, uh, Ezekiel is talking about two different, you know, just the uh, Israel and being restored back from the Babylons and all of those uh, uh, people that had them in, in exile and had them stuck and took all this stuff from them. But we've got a lot of those. I mean, just think about all of the things, and I mentioned a couple of while ago, but think about all the things that have us separated or have us divided. Everybody think. Name one. Race. Race. Okay. Somebody else? Religion. Religion. Somebody else? Huh? Money. Money? All right. That's a real good one. Okay. Anybody else? Evil? All right. Leaders. Huh? Leadership. Leadership. Leaders. Mm -hmm. Now we decided to become a leader. Right. Okay. Anybody else? I mean, we named a lot of things. That's what the Bible is. Kingdom started with. Solomon died, his son. God made the kingdom. It's two parts. And now he's saying, I'm going to bring him up to Okay. So, in this division, we, we talk about all these things and how, uh, Real Frank just mentioned about how the, the kingdom was, was divided in the first place. And the way that you look at it in every uh, different, I guess you could say, every different, uh, every time they change leaders, every time they change administration, the administration would do something different. And they got, they got used to doing this, then they get used to doing that. And the bad part about it, when you look at what, what has happened to us, is that the thing that you have mentioned is the thing that have controlled the leadership that caused them to be able to, to want to uh, act in that, that kind of manner. You know, we used to one just say, well, I see dollar signs, so everything that I, that everything that's going to come in my mind is based on dollar signs. And then you, then you hear the scripture say, well, for the love of money is the root of all evil. It didn't say money. It just said the love of it. In other words, this something that causes you to be more uh, inclined to, to do evil because of your love for it. So, the, the lesson says all for one and one for all. The scripture says that where there's no vision, the people perish, right? If there's not a goal, if there's not something that you're uh, shooting for, if there's not something that you're aiming for, and if it's not a common goal, think about Pentecost. Everybody was there for one reason. They said and they were in one accord in one place. They weren't separated. Now there were some people that were there that didn't know what was going on, but there, but the, the main group of those people were there for one reason. And because they were not divided, and because they were on one accord, and because they were in one place, God showed up in the midst of it. So God is still going to show up. But guess what is happening? We're in the midst of all of these things that for, for this period of time that's just causing us to just be disoriented and divided. So we talked about religion, we talked about money, we talked about you know all these other different things. But how do we become
become a part of this promise that God has made. So, we talked about the first promise. Let's go to the second. The second promise, <clears throat> it says, God will purify the people from idolatry. Okay? So, that's in verse number 23. It says, Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with idols, nor with they de their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of, their, out of all of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will clean them, or cleanse them, so shall they be my people, and I will be their God. Okay, that's, that's, that's the, the next problem, purify. And the NIV says they will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. Okay, let's look at something right quick. And I know, I know I'm going to pick on a lot of us when I talk about this. So, why is it I, I was listening, I was listening to, to uh, something on the radio yesterday. And all these people were in Atlanta. They said, we got a sold out stadium. Over 40,000 people at a baseball game. 40,000. Come September, there's a stadium in Tuscaloosa. There will be fields of capacity of over 101,000 people. That's a lot of folk. Mm -hmm. So, what I did was I put them in comparison to what our lesson is talking about today. Why is it that these places that we have to pay to go to Y'all listen to me. That we have to pay to go to. And it doesn't matter what the cost is, but we'll go. I look at a Lakers ball game and the seats that where the players sit along that bench. I listen to some of the prices that the people pay to sit in those seats. Some of them paying $100,000, $200,000 for season tickets. I mean, think about it. But these seats are filled to capacity. Whether it's Sunday, whether it's Friday, whether it's Saturday, it doesn't matter what day it is, but they are filled to capacity. And people are cheering, and that's the one place that even though there are two teams playing, whatever team is represented, it doesn't matter about uh, to those fans because they're all there rooting for the same team. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I can, and I've and I, and I mentioned this before, but Robert, I can walk into uh, any store or any place and have an Alabama hat on. And I automatically become somebody's friend. <laughs> so it is. But, it, but again, roll tight. But if I had not had that particular hat on, then they look at me upside down, <laughs> sideways, backward, because of what? Because of the division, because of the separation. But at that particular time, everybody has the same goal. We come to root for our team. We got on our all of our paraphernalia. We got, you know, we got our shirts on. We got our caps on. We got the big fingers uh, uh, waving. We got the paint on our face. Some of us go with the shirts off and the stomach painted. Look at that stream that folk go to, go through. 
in order to what? To show unity. But once the game is over, if those same people take off all of those clothes, all of those things that make them unified, mm -hmm. and you see them at a different place and in a different setting, all of that goes out of the window. Mm -hmm. I listened to Stephen, Stephen A. Smith the other morning, and, and it was something that I didn't know. But he was talking about a time that he was pulled over and he had his daughter in the back seat of his car. And the police, he said he had all the windows down on purpose so that the police could see that he had his daughter in the car. And when they pulled up, he asked the officer why he pulled him over. He asked him for his license and registration. He said he put his hand on the steering wheel. He gave him and put his hand on the steering wheel. And he said, can I ask you again, why did, I, why did you pull me over? <coughs> He started to scream at him and tell him, don't talk back to me. But all of a sudden, the other guy that had pulled up at the same time come tapping on the shoulder and said, come here, mom. Pulled him to the side, whispered to him. Said, do you not know who that is? Told him who he was. That same irate officer came back to the car. Gave me license and registration back. Have a good day, sir. Didn't apologize or anything. But because of the division, because of the separation, he could have just, at that moment, lost his life and his dog too. So, that's what I meant earlier when I said that we have made out, we have in our own nation, it don't have to be outside, but it's on the inside now. And there is no unity on the inside. But yet we're, we're fighting wars over there. But there are bigger wars here. Every day. When somebody look at you differently because of what? And that's what I mean by scattered. But God promised, he said, now, all of these things that defile you, these idols, and all these things that have caused you to, to spend this $200,000 at a ball game, and all these things that have caused you to act differently, these, these different uh, these different ways of, of living that you have become accustomed to, all this stuff is going to be taken away because these things are from the heathen. So he promised that there would be a cleansing. But you know what's funny? There's still going to be a lot of folk that don't want to be cleansed. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people, you know, if I see somebody, you know, I'm going to speak to them. I, I don't care if I know them or not, I just speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spoke to a couple of people yesterday and they want to turn the nose up. <laughs> All right. But guess what? All that things are going to come to mm -hmm. an end. It says here, the prophetic message speaks of a new covenant. No one has the power, and I want to say this, I want to uh, dwell on this right quick. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, when I get myself right? Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yeah. No one has the power to purify themselves. Mm -hmm. You cannot purify yourself. I don't care how hard you try, you cannot purify yourself. You don't have the power to do it. See, the, and, and see what happened is the Mosaic law, uh, it was put in place to get people, or give people direction. But the Mosaic law had no what? Purifying power. The Mosaic law had no uh, compassionate power. It said if you did it, 
And guess what? You're done. That's it. If you did it, you're done. That's what the Mosaic Law uh, uh, brought. And so a lot of people didn't realize that because they continued to, to, to live on this, the Mosaic Law, it had, uh, it had no power to create righteousness, but God vowed that he would cleanse his people. And he said, when, when Jesus came, he said, I didn't come uh, in the world to what? To condemn the law. He said, but I came that the law through me might what? Be fulfilled. Because they didn't understand what the law meant. They, they, they read it, but they didn't get the entire effect of what the law meant. And even today, we still fall in that same category. We don't understand what compassion is. We hear about it. We don't understand what grace is. We hear about it. We don't understand what love is, but we hear about it. Because what? Because we are defiled and we need to be cleansed. So when I say we, I always talk about us as a whole people. Because people are defiled as a whole. So he said that we will be purified and we will no longer be hung up in the midst of all these idols. Okay, the next thing, and uh, number three, the third thing, we said, they will rule as king over them. This is where we get to this part now. Verse number 24. In the King James Version, it says, And David, my servant, will be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They also shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And the NIV says, my servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. Okay. Now, This is, this is the part where, where uh, Wyatt will say, uh, yeah, them. But what I'm going to do is have us to turn to Matthew chapter 1. Now, I'm talking about David in this particular passage. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. And this is talking about the genealogy of Jesus. This is how we get to verse to the to the twenty fourth verse. Okay. Now it said the the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is how it happened. And this kind of reminds us of, of the New Testament. I mean, Old Testament. It says, Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Thamar. And Pharaoh begat Ezron. And Ezron begat Aaron. And Aaron begat Amenadab. And Amenadab begat Nason. And Nason begat Salmon. And Salmon begat uh, Booz of Rachab, and Booz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that uh, led by the wife of Uriah, or had by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon begat Roboam, and Roboam begat, begat Adia, and Adia begat Asa, and Asa begat Josephat, and Josephat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias, and Ozias begat Jotham, and Jotham begat Achar, Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekiel, and Ezekiel begat Manasseh, and Manasseh begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat uh, Jeconias, and brethren. And about the time they were carried away to Babylon, and after that they were brought to Babylon, 
And just not begat Salathia. Salathia begat Zorobed, and Zorobed, Zorobed, Zorobed begat Abiyad, and Abiyad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadak, and Sadak begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud, and Eliud begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Matthew, and Matthew begat Jacob. And here we go. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, to whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generation from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So, now when we look at verse number 24 again, it says that David will be king over them. Not that David, the shepherd boy, but because of the bloodline, because of the lineage, Jesus Christ came through the root of Jesse, the root of Jesse which had David, and David uh, was the king, so therefore, this bloodline that begat David and Jesse and all of these ran down through Joseph, and Joseph, uh, the, the father of Jesus, and, and Mary. So therefore, this is how this bloodline started. So this King David, which he is talking about, is Jesus Christ. Okay? So not David himself, but it says, my servant David, or Jesus, will be king over them, and they will all have what? One shepherd, which is Jesus Christ, and they will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. So when Jesus comes on the scene, all of these things that have been promised, he came to what? Fulfill the promise. <clears throat> right? Look at, look at commentaries and they said, actually, he's going to raise David up. He's going to raise him up. David's a big four week, he said. <laughs> yeah, that's, so when you have to be careful with stuff and read it. Right. You go back and tie it up, you just see what's about. You have to do it with the scripture. Because this is what this is this this person that we're talking about, and I mentioned this a while ago that we cannot purify ourselves. Jesus came. It said without the shedding of blood, there would be no what? Remission of sins. So the remission of sins and the cleansing is what's going to purify us, that we will be able to what? To be restored. And only those that accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and those that Somebody said, get on board the old ship of Zion. For those that get on board of this, this uh, promise that Jesus has made, they will be able to partake of the promise. But again, there are still things that have to be done because of us being separated, us being, us being divided. But it's going to come to pass. Okay? So, then, verse number, uh, verse 25, we're going to look at the fourth promise. God will establish an everlasting covenant of peace with his people. Okay? They shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein when they and their children and their children's children forever, and my servant David shall be their prince forever. Okay? And the NIV said, they will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever, and David, my servant, will be their prince forever. So, what we just talked about, <clears throat> it continues uh, in the 25th verse. Because <clears throat> this covenant, it cannot be broken or vacated. Uh, God will gather his people, shelter them in a place of perfect peace that is marked as un unprecedented generational longevity. So, just like God made the covenant with Abraham, there's nobody that's going to be able to prevent the covenant from being fulfilled. Nobody. 
Nothing. No. Now we sometimes we feel that there is a disconnect, but there's nothing that's going to be able to keep it from being fulfilled. Because what? It's God's promise. And God is, God is not slack concerning his promise. Everything he said is going to come to pass. And if you look, just think about it. We look at things as they are happening. And sometimes we're at all. But if we would go back and read the scripture, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything that God says, I mean, we, we see the signs of everything that's transpired. These killings, shooting children, all of these things that are happening every day. He said the love of men will be what? Wax cold. Children rising up against their parents. I think it was yesterday or the day before in Huntsville that uh, there was a father and son, uh, both of them were shot. One shot the other one, and uh, one was charged and the other one wasn't. But the father was in the hospital. Division, huh? These nations. Still fight. It's still the Bible. But that ain't going to stop the promise. No. But we know that it's fulfilled. So I think when he brought them back from Babylon, that fulfilled it. No. That didn't do it. That didn't do it. It hadn't come to, to fruition yet. But the promise is coming. That's why we still have a war. That's why everything is still, still going on. Because guess what? There hadn't been any purification. And there hasn't been any unification. In order for unification to come, the purification has to come first. Because when we defile and everything that we think is evil, how in the world can we become uh, joined together, unified, unless everybody starts thinking evil? That will bring forth a bad part of unity. But that's not what the promise is. The promise is all of God's people will be restored. So we'll go through trial, we'll go through tribulation, we'll go through all different kind of things. But yet, if we just hold out and endure the hardships, then we will be able to experience the unification process. I got to hurry up and get done. Then the verse, the last one, it says, God will dwell among his people. These are the five things. The temple of God's dwelling place shall be sanctified by God's holy presence. Uh, both translations in this, what we read, hint at protection, whether spiritual or physical, God comes down to dwell with man, transforming earth into heaven. So God comes down and he uh, gets in the midst and all of the God's people that have been suffering these things, he said, now guess what? You're going to be restored. Everything that you lost is going to be restored to you. So when Ezekiel goes back and he starts looking at them bone that was very, very dry. And God asked him the question. He asked him, he said, son, he said, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, well, as far as I know, from what I see, bro, I don't see no hope for these jokes. <laughs> I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what, that, was, that was how he looked. He said, but, but he said it like this, Lord God, only you know. Because what I see, I, I don't see no, no, no change. But then God told him, he said, well, guess what? In order for this to happen, I need you to do something for me. He said, prophesy to these bones, and they shall live. And he said, I prophesied as I was commanded. 
And as I prophesied, there was a great noise. There was a rattling. The bones began to join together. From the foot all the way to the head. From the hand all the way up to the shoulder. They began to join together. But then, after he looked, the body, the bone was there. But there was some other thing that needed to be done. <laughs> so God called the sinews to come up on it. He called the flesh to come up on it. But then there was still something missing. God said, well, speak to the four winds. And he spoke. And the breath came into him. And they were able to come back to life. That's the spirit of God. The only thing that's going to purify us, the only thing that's going to unify, unify us, the only one that's going to conquer this division is that we have to turn as it tells us in 2 Corinthians, I mean 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways and say, then will I hear from heaven. And I give that scene. He says, and I will heal the land. But we got to become part of the process, the unification process. All for one and one for all. God bless you. Anybody have any questions? If not, Thank you for your time, and we'll ask if there's anything from the, the young folk. Good morning. Today we learned that Ezekiel told his people that he would restore their land if they would obey God's word. Even though sometimes we mess up, God's love is so unconditional that he forgives us for our wrongdoing. Jesus promised verses. Jesus promised verses peace, joy, and everlasting life. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And also, I want to thank Russell for coming back there and telling the kids when you disobey your parents, your days on earth will be short. Since they didn't uh, believe me, so I had to call Russell. And I said, when like your parents tell you to do something, you don't do it. You showing your life. And I thank you for. Coming back there, help me explain to them. Help all your job. Yeah. We want to thank you for doing the review. Yeah. Any announcements? Is there anything else? You're not just about your here for. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this study period. Father God, we thank you for your word, for this, which is all true. We thank you for opening our, our eyes and our minds, Father God, that we may receive it this morning. We just give you all of Praise and all the glory. We thank you for this hour. You do know that we ask you to keep your arms around, Father God, protect them all their endeavors, dear Lord. Make sure, Father God, that they know you, Father God, for who you are, dear Lord. We, we thank you for the past that you have put over him. We ask you to continue <coughs> to lead him in the way that you would have him to lead us. We just thank you for most of all. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.